Hello and welcome to the Tea Party Hardy channel. Can we please, please, please stop everybody lying about the pilgrims? Oh my god, it, this is 2020. It is the 400th year anniversary of when the Mayflower left Plymouth, England, and then landed up, kind of sort of accidentally, in Plymouth Rock of America. And I've just spent the last two weeks researching this, and what I came to find out of additional details is just mind-blowing when you compare it to the modern articles that are coming out this year, and the absolute lies that are being told about the story. So, if you're interested to know the real Pilgrim story, without any fancy graphics or any fancy videos, you just want to know the story and know what's true and what's not true, stick around for a couple of minutes and I'll do a very brief version highlighting where the modern accounts are flat out lying. Okay, so let's get crack a with this for those of you who are interested in the real Pilgrim story. The Pilgrims were in England. King James II had come to power and you got to remember, this is when they were swinging back and forth between Protestant and Catholic, and Protestant and Catholic. So whenever they switched, it, it was a big mess. I mean, keep in mind, there was Bloody Mary, and now there's King James II, who actually is the King James who wrote the Bible. Well, you know what I mean. Not He didn't write the Bible. He wrote the English version Bible that didn't get him burned at the stake or killed like the other people that had done it in English beforehand. Different story. Okay, so... He's all about, you got to do my religion my way, just like the monarch right before him and the monarch right after him and so forth and so on. And the congregation that we care about, who will become the pilgrims, they are separatist. And that means they want to separate from the church. I get tired of hearing the modern accounts where they say, they are Puritans. No, Puritans are Puritans and separatists are separatists. Catholics are Catholics and Baptists are Baptists. They're not the same. And a, you wouldn't need a new name if they were the same. So for those of you who are doubting my recollection, my, uh, my version of this, just ask yourself, if separatists and Puritans are the same, why do they have a different name for separatists? So just start with that logic question. Okay, so what happens is they land up sneaking over to the Netherlands, or as I was told when I was growing up, it was called Holland, but it turns out that was wrong and they changed it last summer or whatever. Okay, so they go over to the Netherlands, and I say sneaking because they have to do it little by little because the King James keeps arresting them and finding them. So they tried to go over there in one big bulk and that didn't work, so then they trickle over and that worked. Once they're over there in the Netherlands, they get jobs as tailors, weavers, basically all the things in the textiles following that logic, spoiler alert coming ahead, makes them really, really lousy farmers. <laughs> really lousy farmers when they get to the New World. People who sow your clothes don't necessarily know how to sow seed. See what I did there? Okay, now, now they're in Holland. Things are going somewhat peachy. They have the religious freedom because in the Netherlands, in the 1600s, it turns out they were the hippie era. And, you know, it's like, dude, you can worship however you want here. It's all good. But their children of the separatists were growing up in the Netherlands and therefore learning all the Netherland ways. And it kind of concerned them because these expats were still wanted to be somewhat of pats. And they're like, hey, our kids can't speak English for nothing. And, and, and they're not really being the separatists that we want them to be. Some of them even want to join the Navy and all this other stuff. And so they were just afraid rightfully so, that their kids were assimilating to the culture they were born and raised into. So now they have discussions and go, uh, what if we go to the New World? And I'm like, are you crazy? There's nothing there! And then when they're like, well, but there's nothing there and we could be there and we could, you know, still pray for freedom and, and maybe actually make some money because they weren't making anything because they were foreigners in the Netherlands and it wasn't America, and therefore the foreigners didn't get treated as well. And they, um, yeah, they were making a living, but it was hard. Oh my God, did they work hard. So in that regard, they were set up for the New World. It's just they weren't farmers. <laughs> None of them were farmers. Okay, so just for fun, I'll throw in Miles Standish's names because they hire him for security. 
Then they say, let's try the New World. They go through the legal machinations with England, even though they're in and they're expats in, in the Netherlands. They go through the legal machinations with King James II and get the um, they get permission to go to the Virginia colony, the same one from the Pocahontas story, yeah. And so they get that. Then they rent their boat. And, oh, I won't give you the saga that of what it's like to rent the boat, but it's a good story. Anyway, they rent the boats to go to the New World. They have the Steedwell, uh, sorry, Speedwell. They have the Speedwell and the Mayflower. And so they take off in August. Woohoo! And the Speedwell starts sinking. They're like, this is, we're sinking! So they go back. They try it again a couple weeks later after they fix the speedwell, then they didn't fix the speedwell and it starts sinking again. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, now, now that they've done the speedwell thing, now they're stuck with just the Mayflower. And I do mean stuck with because there was people on both. Well, now that they're all on the Mayflower, all of them won't fit. Therefore, several don't get to go. And they get on the Mayflower and they're going to travel across the Atlantic starting in September. There's there's like every reason in the world to go, this this is nuts. Uh, it's hurricane season. And you're going in a single boat. You don't have a rescue boat anymore. Most of the time they traveled in uh, groupings in those days so that you had a rescue boat. Well, that one of the, the, the perks of the Speedwell was to do that, but it had to be rescued. So anyways, um, yeah, they're, they're going to do it. And, and now there's 102 of them. And this number, I see this number constantly, and it's never clear if the 102 includes the crew or if that's all the pilgrims, but I think it includes the crew also, but it gets really confusing with the numbers. All right, so you have 102. They leave in, in September. <laughs> They're going to get there in the winter. Did y'all not plan this? Yes, we did, and we left several months earlier, and it didn't work. It's not our fault. Okay, fair enough. All right. And, oh, and it wasn't cheap to go there. They had to indenture themselves for almost seven years. Most people round off and do the seven years, but it's actually six years, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to round off too, seven years. So now they're all indentured. And they have to pay back uh, via the fish, via the furs, and the lumber slash timber. I don't know how that would have worked because they never ended up doing it because most of them are going to die. But anyways, oh, another spoiler. All right, so now they're coming over here. And they do hit a hurricane. And when they hit a hurricane... Um, the mast snaps and the main beam breaks inside the ship. They just happen to have this gigantic screw that, um, and I've, different sources say different things. One say it's for a printing press and another one says it's a, a home building tool. Take your pick. Those are the ones that are offered. Nonetheless, it worked. They monkey rigged it and, and so they were able to limp all the way to the New World. In the process of coming to the New World, uh, one of the ladies has a baby and she names him Oceanus. And then a few days before they see land, one of the younger passengers dies. So they got one, and then they lost one. And that's just the beginning of their troubles. Okay, so now they're in the New World, but they're not where they're supposed to be because of the hurricane. They got pushed north. So now they're in what we call Cape Cod, where in those days it was not called Cape Cod. So they're way up there now, and they, they, they go on land to get some food, because they've got scurvy like some kind of crazy. Oh yeah, so the pilgrims are all shoved into the middle deck. Remember that Mayflower is a passenger, sh it's not a passenger ship, it's a cargo ship. So it's very hard to not hear this story and think of, I know, forgive me, the Millennium Falcon. It's a cargo ship, <laughs> and they're hiding in those decks from the stormtroopers, it's the same thing. The pilgrims lived on the middle deck, which was the gun deck, you know, for cannons, and it's five and a half feet tall at most, because other sources only give it five feet. I'll let you choose if it's five and a half or five. Um, most of the sources record that the boat is 90 feet long and 24 feet across. There are other ones that have it a little bit longer, but most of them stick around 90. Okay, so they're living in a cubby that is five, will be nice and say five and a half feet tall. And according to the reports that I read, each family was allotted on that deck that's five and a half feet tall, uh, seven feet by two feet. Measure that. Measure that. It's, it's, it's insanely tiny. And that was where the family, that was their little spot because they built these little bitty barriers. And so that's where they were. And of course, there's no bathroom. 
and they got seasick vehemently, and so the boat smelled like barf and poo and urine the entire trip. The people were only able to take one Bible, and this is the family. The family gets one Bible, one trunk, and some tools. So they have basically one change of clothes that they're stuck in for three months because they're going to get stuck on the ship because of the weather. So they get to Cape Cod, go to land, get some food to help deal with fighting the scurvy. Sadly, we're going to find out in a few weeks it's too little too late. But nonetheless, that's still the right thing to do. So they get the food. Then they go up Cape Cod, and then they go down to the inside of Cape Cod. And they stop once, and they get some more food, and they're looking around for a place to land. Uh, not land, but um, settle. And then they go a little bit more south inside of the Cape. And then they get attacked by the Indians, or whatever you want to call them. But as far as I know, they're still Indians, because they're still called Indian Reservations, and the Bureau of Indians. And it's like, so yeah, if you want to fight it with some PC word, go for it. But when you choose the PC word, just be ready to change it again in a few years, because that's how PC works. So I'm going to stay with the one that we used for 500 years. Okay, 400. Fair enough. Okay, so then they were attacked. I'm like, okay, so I guess we're not going to stay here. Then they go back on the boat. And this is when you get to the famous part where they decide, well, do we go back to Virginia where we're supposed to be? Or do we cheat and just land on the mainland and start our own little thing in Mobabi? Because if we do, we'll be breaking the king's orders. And for the first time in an, the English-speaking world, we will be making a decision of how to rule ourselves without the permission of our rulers. And who, by diggy, they all voted yes. And they said, write it down. And they did it in under 200 words. Those people were ready for Twitter. So they wrote it down in under 200 words. And therefore, we have the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact. And that's how that came to be. And it's, it's, it's the rules of self-governing. And of course, the reason we make a big deal about it in history today is because it's the first time in the English-speaking world people decided to self-govern without permission. That's one. Two, Thomas Jefferson cheated and um, copied off their homework to do the Declaration of Independence, and James Madison, a few years later, copied off of Thomas Jefferson, and then he also copied off of the Mayflower Compact. So it's highly influential for those three reasons. That's why it's a big deal. All right, so that's that. Then they land on Plymouth Rock, and I've seen some sources that say, I'm going to guess on this one erroneously, that the Pilgrims named it Plymouth Rock, because I have way too many other sources saying, no, it was John Smith. Yeah, that John Smith, the Pocahontas one. John Smith named it four years earlier. I'm going to stick with that one because John Smith is the one that gave them the map. So since they had the map, it's fair to assume that Smith put the name on there too. You can choose. You can say the Pilgrims did it. You can say Smith did it. I'm in the Smith camp on that one. All right. So now they're there. And it is winter and they are sick. They are sick. They are just sick as a dog. Because the scurvy and they were supposed to be there earlier and the captain of the boat goes who's not a pilgrim by the way um the captain's like um yeah i can't i kind of can't leave these people here they will all die so i'm gonna go ahead and stick around so they stayed around one by one they start dropping like flies there's only five to seven of them that are healthy enough at the time in order to build the common house first and then their little cabins once the common house was built now you have the remaining living sick people on the boat and then the remaining people that are on land they're in the common house and both of them are essentially a hospital and oh i skipped the part with washing clothes and de-stinking the boat oh well there's a part where the women get off the boat in the earlier days and the first thing they did was go wash their clothes kind of don't blame them okay and then they de-stink it with with this uh smoke but anyways okay sorry flashing back to where we are so okay so now they're dropping dead boom 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 and they're kind of hoping somewhere along the lines that they would see some of the locals to maybe get some help and get some food because they kind of don't have either. And they don't see anybody, which they're like, okay, look, we knew this place was abandoned. We didn't know it was that bad. I don't know if they were aware of the great dying, which happened in the four years prior to them, which is when the European diseases 
that had migrated from Africa up to Europe and through the Mideast to, to Europe to now it's migrating to America. So for all the people going, they spread their disease, it was their turn. That's how it works, man. Did you, this is 2020. Did you not watch the pandemic do the same thing? There it goes from China to Europe to America. That's how diseases work. Hello, wakey, wakey. This is not a new thing. Okay. So, and it wasn't anybody's fault. And either one, even though in the China case, they knew and they still let them fly up. Whatever, it, would have, it still would have spread anyways, because that's what cooties do. Cooties are vicious like that. All right. Now, finally, in March, which is still pretty cold in the Northeast, I would guess, this big Indian fellow appears who's... You know, he's wearing Indian clothes, which is to say, he's got a loincloth, and that's about it. And like, the ladies are like, well, hello, that's uh, that's quite the outfit you have there, sir. Anyways, he speaks English. His name is Samoset. Samoset's story is so cool, because like, when you do the, the, the Thanksgiving story, you get what I'm telling you. There's Samoset, and he says, welcome, English. And they're like, whoa, dude, you speak English. That's right. How'd you learn the English? I learned it from the fishermen. It's not like you people are the first ones to ever show up. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know. But the people 400 years from now might not know that. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 well. Anyways, so he learned it from the fishers and from the traders, fur traders. And, but his actual story, if you do his biography, oh, my God, it's way cool. Definitely worth looking up. I'm like, holy mackerel. This dude's kind of awesome. And his name, Samoset, means man who walks on much. Well, he's from Maine, and he's down there. It's like, wow, he really, really does like to go walking. And I don't have the exact mileage between the Wampanoag camp and the camp uh, that the the pilgrims built but it did say in the accounts that it took three to four days to get there so man when Somerset goes out for a walk that dude really goes out for a walk so anyways he greets him and it's hilarious and this one kind of like do you have any of that English beer <laughs> like yeah can you hook me up <laughs> so there you go Somerset's like I haven't had any beer in a while give me some beer so they give him beer and they chat and Somerset was really impressed with them that they you know, they were nice. And as many people point out, particularly the Wampanoags, when you hear their account, they're like, well, they brought their families. They can't be that dangerous because nobody brings their families to war. Wise thinking. And it was true. Okay. So Samoset says, okay, I'm going to bring back somebody who can speak English better than I can. And he does. He comes back a few days later with uh, Squanto to Squantum, whichever you want. Now, oh, get your checklist, baby, because now we're getting into the part that gets all screwed up. As if it wasn't screwed up enough that they say Puritan when they're separatist. Okay. Squanto's early history, because when I was doing the research last week, I ran into four different versions of his story. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to go way deeper and get out of the these these like kid versions, because I use the kid versions because I'm sharing the story with kids usually. And But I, I need to know what really happened. Well, it turns out it's unbelievably unknown. And the historians fight over it. So when you hear with certainty how Squanto landed up in Europe, uh, they're making it up as far as the certainty. It is disputed. We don't know. There's a version where he goes to Europe twice. One of the versions, he goes with John Smith. One of the versions, he comes back with John Smith. One of the versions, he gets captured by some dude whose last name is Hunt, which makes it pretty easy to remember. And there's another version where he's all like having a good time with the sailors. And the sailors are like, hey, come here. We want to show you something really cool. And the boy's like, okie dokie, okie. And he gets on the boat and then he's kidnapped. Again, there's all these versions. So what I want you to know here, for those of you that care about the real story, we don't know the real story of Squanto's early years. We don't. We do know he landed up in Europe. He learned how to speak English in Europe quite fluently because he's a kid. He's like between nine and 13. So that's all we know for sure. We don't know how many times he went to Europe, if it was once or twice. We don't know if he did it under duress or not. We don't. And the fact that all these other people speak to it with certainty, pfft, on them, and that's why I'm making this video, because I'm just sick of all these lies. Okay. So Squanto is looking at them, and it's like, guys, you really don't have a clue how to farm, do you? It's like, no, but if you need your britches sewed up, we're right there for you. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. So he shows them how to farm properly, how to, where to hunt, how to hunt in the native land. Because again, they're from Europe! <laughs> You're like, oh, but it was a long time ago. You didn't go hunt bears and deer in the middle of the Netherlands. Well, maybe it did, but they didn't. They were, they were people that worked in textiles. Okay. So he was an enormous help. Then they get introduced to Massasoit, the Sacum, the chief, the dude who's in charge of the Wampanoags. Not to be confused with Massasoit, who I found out. Oh. He's actually a chief as well, and he's a chief of the Abenakis. And I'm like, oh, so it's just two chiefs hanging out like, hey, 
And I seen these dudes over there. They're like, oh, well. Okay. So anyways, Squanto being with the Europeans for his time in Europe, not only did he learn the language, but he knew their customs. And he's like, these pilgrim people, they're not so bad. I think Samoset's right. They're, they're really, I think they're going to be okay. And they, you can trade and get some really cool stuff. And considering how many of us are left after the great dying, it might be helpful because those Nargisets next there, they're, they're kind of cranky. And, uh, they didn't get hit as hard by the plague as we did. To which Massasoit's like, you know, I don't like it because I don't like it to white people, but I'll give it a shot. And so he does. And they meet, and things go well. And they meet a few more times, and things continue to go well. And they're like, okay, you want to go to the next step? Do you want to Do you want to go to third base? And they do, and they sign the peace treaty. When they sign that peace treaty, spoiler alert again, that peace treaty between the pilgrims, which is down to 50 people, or 52, depending on which account you take, at most 52, the 52 pilgrims that are left sign the peace treaty with Massasoit. That peace treaty remains in full effect, as in everybody honors it, for the life of everybody who signed it. It does not cease being effective until Massasoit's death. I want you to think about that when you hear and read all these examples where people are tearing into the pilgrims being horrible to the Indians. There's nothing to back that up. The pilgrims had a peace treaty that was extremely successful, as in both sides did it, until Massasoit died. Ask yourself, ask your teacher, is there another example you can show me of a peace treaty being signed by groups of people that succeeded all the way until everybody who signed it died? The answer will be yes, but oh, it's a very small percentage. And to blow that off and act like the pilgrims got along horribly with the Indians of the Wampanoags. There were no more Patuxets. The only one left was Squanto. His whole family had been wiped out by the plague. Okay, that's not something to blow off. So while they're like, ooh, I was watching the real story, what, no, what, what really happened on YouTube. I'm like, dude, you paint this a dark, sinister story when in fact, here's these zealot little bitty separatists, and I mean little bitty as in 102 max, and they come over here, half of them die, they don't give up, they don't complain, and they push on. To the best of my knowledge, the only ones that went back to Europe was like Miles Standish went back because he was just the hired hand he was he was the security He's, he wasn't supposed to stay but he stayed he stayed quite a while though anyways so the ones that weren't the pilgrims that were here just to do the work because they were called the strangers by the pilgrims some of them did go back but the pilgrims stayed and the pilgrims got along great in fact massasoit names two of his sons with english names one is named alex and or alexander and the other one is named philip philip will grow up and philip will not be crazy about the people that come after the pilgrims, as in following the pilgrims. And yeah, nobody really is. I'll get to that at the end. Okay, so now, when you hear that they were terrible to the Indians, there's nothing to support that. It's impossible to find, and if I'm wrong, do put it in the comments. It's, <laughs> it's impossible to find how, that, how they couldn't have gotten along better. They really got along that well. Because guess what? They had mutual things that they needed to exchange, and they did, and it was fantastic. The pilgrims got to learn how to farm instead of sewing clothes and do it well, so much that in 1621 they did what we later in the future would call Thanksgiving. They didn't call it Thanksgiving at that time. It would be two more years before they would do their Thanksgiving, which they called Harvest Home in their day. And I'm not going to do the whole thing of the history of Thanksgiving there. At least I don't think so. I want to get through this part because this is where all the lies are. And... Yeah, so they didn't call it Thanksgiving. We did because that lady in the 1860s. All right, so setting that to the side because that's in the future of several hundreds of years and 150, 200 years in our past. Okay, Marty, where are you with the DeLorean when we need you? Okay, so they got along great. Now, Squanto kind of... There's different accounts about what happens to him at the end, which is only two years later. He has some problems with, um, with, with, they start to suspect that he's double dealing 
the Indians think he's double dealing, and so do the pilgrims. And then he dies of... It, he finally gets the plague, and then he dies. Some say that he's poisoned. I'm like, yeah, but do you have any evidence for the poisoning? Because everybody says he dies of the plague, and then you're coming off saying 500 years... Sorry, 400 years later, oh, no, he died of poisoning. Really? So we've got 400 years of historians who, like, never seem to think that was an issue. And now all of a sudden, all of our geniuses do. Mm, maybe. But I'm going to put a triple dot after that, maybe. All right, so that's the end of his story. And then, oh, Massasoit's story is awesome. <laughs> okay, so he gets older, and he's like, he wants to retire. Who knew you could do that? <laughs> and he gives the power to Alexander first. And then, I don't know what happened to Alexander, but obviously Philip eventually becomes the boss but Massasoit just moves north and he just kicks it up there with the other tribes <laughs> like he really did retire <laughs> like wow that's so cool anyways and then okay now we're gonna go to part two where the other lies are so in conclusion of the first half of the story the separatist left King James II went to Holland sorry Netherlands for 10 to 12 years again it depends on which version you read Fear their children becoming assimilated, reasonably so. Go to the New World, have a hurricane, land up way up north, decide to go to the king, write the Mayflower Compact, land up in Plymouth, make friends, well, half of them die, I probably shouldn't gloss that over, um, half of them die, and then Samoset shows up, and then Squanto shows up, and then Massasoit shows up. And then they make like. There's even a story where Massasoit gets extremely sick. And the pilgrims go to see him. And they're like, oh, he's dead. I'm like, nah, well, we want to go see his family then. So they get there. And he wasn't dead. They were, it was, his, his death was prematurely announced. And so somehow they're able to heal him. As far as we know, they, all they did was give him... Um, sassafras which we call root beer in california give him sassafras and then after they give him sassafras give him some chicken soup and he's and massasoit goes from being blind to being able to see in a few hours and then he's up and running literally in three days so might have been covid anyway and he's he praises him and it's like because they got along great all right now part two so the pilgrims got along fabulous. They signed the treaty. They held to the treaty until all of them died. They named their kids after European people and Indian people. It was going fabulous. Then comes the other folks. Now comes the Puritans, not the separatists. Here comes the Puritans. The Puritans are a pain in the butt. Nobody likes the Puritans, including the Puritans, because a few years later in 1692, they'd be calling all each other, which, 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 yeah. The Puritans were a serious pain in the keister, and they're still in Boston to this day. Now, the Puritans got along with the Indians like oil and water, because they treated them like dirt, like they treated each other for the record. That's where the problem is. And what's infuriating is when you know the story that I just shared with you, you find out that the modern-day folk for the last few years keep blaming the pilgrims for what happened from the Puritans, who came later. You don't blame Group A for Group B, who shows up on the scene later. You don't do that. There is nothing about the Puritan story that overlaps with the Pilgrims. The Pilgrims maintained relations with the Wampanoags until they all died. When Philip does King Philip's War, and he does his rebellion, and he, he goes and attacks all of the Puritans. He attacked the Puritans. He never attacked the Pilgrims. He didn't. He was friends with them. He liked them. They were buds. Puritans, on the other hand, mm -mm, stupid pigs, would th th their pigs would go and march through and eat their corn and eat their food. It's like, get your pigs out of our yard. Mm -mm. You can't have a yard. You don't believe in land ownership. No, that's a bunch of myth from the future, too. We absolutely believe in ha having land. Why do you think we are... Why do you think we have these unions with, with the Wampanoags of all these tribes coming together? Because we don't want the other tribes coming in and taking our food from our land. Yeah, don't tell us we don't know what land ownership is. Please. Okay. 
That's the true story of Thanksgiving. The pilgrims were insanely brave, insanely courageous. They knew that the odds of surviving in Virginia, where they were supposed to go, were 20%, was an 80% death rate in the colony of Virginia when they set sail. They actually fared better. They had a 50% survival rate so that they could have religious freedom. Yet here, in 2020 America, we have <laughs> no religious freedom. Can't go to church in several states. Blue states, I'm talking to you. There's no religious freedom if you can't even go to church to worship. That's no different than what King James did. I don't, I don't care if it's the cootie or not. They faced a 50%, no, no, they experienced a 50% death rate. And they still pressed on and praised God and stayed in America. We have a 0 0.05 or less death rate in America, and we can't go to church, and we can't even have food on the outside of a restaurant in L.A. County. The first Americans, the pilgrims, these first Americans were brave they were steadfast to their religion. They were steadfast to their ideals. 2020 Americans, 0 0.05, oh, stay at home order, stay at home order. We are the cowardly last Americans. We will not survive being afraid of a 0 0.05 death rate. We won't. We've destroyed the economy already. And we've made other choices. This is Tea Party Hardy channel. If you made it this far, you know this channel spends a lot of time praising the Constitution, which has been, until last night, got to throw this in, the Supreme Court actually did say, you're getting your religious freedom back in New York. Alleluia, Amy Coney Barrett. Because Mr. Liberal, Justice Roberts, sided with the liberals again. It's like, dude, you're, you're a liberal. Quit pretending like you're a conservative. You haven't sided with the conservatives in almost a decade now. But Amy Coney Barrett broke the tie on, and, oh... Truly something to be thankful for. All right, that's the end of this video. That, that that's, that's the version. As promised, no special effects or anything. And this, this is uh, the Mayflower 2. Did an awesome restoration. It's very sad. They did all of this stuff for the restoration for the 400-year anniversary, and then, then the lockdowns came, and, and then the lockdowns came. And so everybody was dressed up, but no place to go. And what's really cool is the Plymouth in England where they set sail from, they're participating in it too. All in vain, of course. I mean, the good side is you get 1620 to celebrate the launch, but they can also celebrate, again, 400 and 1621 for the first Thanksgiving, which wasn't the first Thanksgiving. That was that lady, Miss Hale, in uh, in the 1860s. You can, or eight, she's the 1830s, but Lincoln, like, bought into the idea in the 1860s, 1863, actually. She wanted to use Thanksgiving to bring the North and South together because she's seen the division that the slavery was causing and she's seen the Civil War coming. Tell me that doesn't sound like 2020 where, hey, you know, Thanksgiving's a chance to bring us together and, uh, and the government's telling us not to. The government's saying, don't, you, don't, don't, don't come together. Stay away from your family. You're going to kill grandma. Uh, a friend of mine sent me a link to her daughter's wedding, which was a week ago. And they did the wedding outside, and they did the reception outside. But there was at least 150, 200 people there. It's hard to tell because the camera lies with, with crowds. And, but there was a lot of people down there singing, and they're dancing, and, they, you know, they're dancing like the Jewish style where you, you do the, the circles with the men and the girls, all that stuff. And I told her, I said, don't show this to the governor of California. He'll tell you everybody's going to die. They're all going to die. And she said, yeah. It was a month ago. Nobody's got sick or nobody died. Doesn't mean people couldn't get sick, but guys, it's a point zero five. It's a point zero five. It's tragic for those point zero five. But if you look at the numbers, and you all know this if you made it this far, you know that those numbers include people with comorbidities. If you take the people out of comorbidities and you look at the ones that just died from being, I'm sorry, it's really hard just to live past 70 to begin with. And it's even harder to live past 80. That's why there's not a whole lot of 80 something people running around, except in Congress on the Democrat side. Oh, what is up with that? All right. I've more than stayed past my welcome. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the future with something who knows.
times are really odd. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>